Hello, my name is Zoe, also known as Leoba, and I'm one of the Vikings here at Jorvik. And I have a particular interest in Viking food, because we all eat food today. How on earth do we know what these people were eating while they were living in this city? The Coppergate excavation yielded a huge amount of information because the grounds here were wet, waterlogged, which left a lot of wooden remains. So we know they had wooden bowls from the centres that come out of them. Wooden bowls would be used for all sorts of things, for storing food and perhaps for producing food as well. I have here a butter churn. It's a small one. We generally don't find the structure of the butter churn, stop falling off. But when you're making butter with it, you need one of these sticks with a dash on the end of it. This is a dash. And I've learned that if you put it in your butter churn and you put too much milk in it, when the milk starts to stiffen up because the butter is forming, the dash comes clean off. And it's a real mess to stick your hand in the churn to fish it out. And this is the bit we find. We find the dashes. So we know they're making butter here. Were they having the same problem as I did when it got stuck inside? Butter would have been seasonal. Cows only produce calves in the spring and that's when milk would become available. And they may have been making cheese out of it and they may have been making yoghurt out of it as well. But we don't have any evidence for those objects. It's just a, an educated guess as to whether they are actually making them. There is evidence for bread troughs. It's a dough trough. It's made out of a wood and you mix your bread in there. Now most of the breads would have been flatbreads that were cooked on the fire on the griddle but they would have yielded wild yeast in the air around us and they may have made a loaf something like this. It would have been a sourdough loaf and there is evidence in Scandinavia of actual ovens being formed. The environmental waste that we found here in Coppergate tells us from the seeds and plants that are remaining what animals and plants they were eating. We know that they had fruit and vegetables. Now fruit, we've got apples and pears slowberries, elderberries, blackberries, hawthorn, things like that, and they would have been collected in the autumn. People would learn how to dry them to preserve them for the winter, especially apples, because you can slice those and dry them above the fire. This time of year, January we're in, there's awful lack of food growing in the countryside. There's nothing to go and pick. But in the autumn you can go and pick nuts, and there is evidence for walnuts. From this excavation we've got hazelnuts as well, and almonds. And if you have a slightly sweet tooth, don't worry, this is not a waste paper basket, it looks like one, but it's got a hole in it. That's for the bees to come in and out. It's called a skep. And we found evidence of a skep during the excavation, including the bodies of some bees that produce honey. Meat is available more in the winter months because you're slaughtering the animals so you don't have to overwinter them. We have sheep, goat, cow. We have wild fowl, such as ducks and geese and chickens, so they have eggs as well. The bigger animals were probably taken out of the city and, and reared in the countryside and driven into the city for slaughter. Fish is another staple that they eat. They, they had a taste for eels here in Coppergate. We found a lot of eel bones. The fish in the first part of the Viking period are freshwater fish from the local rivers, including perch and roach and things like that. But towards the end of the Viking period, where the pollution gets higher and higher in the river system, you get deep sea fish such as haddock and cod coming in. I'm talking of cod. I have a creature here. This is called stockfish. If I bang it on the table, you can hear how hard it is. This animal would have been hung up on a great big rack by the sea to dry. It is rock hard, but if you skin it and flake off the fish flesh from inside and put it in a stew or just chew it in your mouth to make it go wet, it still tastes of fish and is extremely nutritious. And this is the sort of meat that they would be eating in the winter. Peas can be dried as well. So imagine a, a fish supper with peas and a bit of bread and maybe some ale in that Torxy ware pot that we have. We also have a lot of evidence for knives. Knives made out of metal, some of them with steel edges, used for cutting up your food. There are no forks in this period whatsoever. And we have two types of spoon. A spoon made out of horn, which we think they made. We have evidence for horn working here. And we have a double-ended spoon, which is rather remarkable. It's made out of iron, but it's coated in tin, so it looks like a silver spoon. So you could put out your best silver spoons 
for your dinner when your mate comes over and they wouldn't know that they're actually iron spoons instead. Rather sneaky, isn't it? Drinks would be beer or ale. If you're wealthier, you might have wine from the Rhineland. You might have mead, which is made with honey. If you live in the city, you would not be drinking water because it's so polluted with sewage and industrial waste. But if you lived in the countryside, you may have a slightly healthier diet. But our diets today are not as seasonal as people in the past. People had access to food as and when they grew. Today, you can buy your strawberries at Christmas, not in the Viking period. We also know, my final piece, on the toilet waste. Rather disgusting, really. People eat things they make deposits in their toilets and from those toilets we know they're eating cherries and not spitting out the pips, they're eating small fish not spitting out the bones. So we get our evidence from all sorts of environmental waste. Thank you for listening, I hope you enjoyed my talk.